father of snowboarding, Jake Burton, talked to us about Sean White and today's half-pipe competition. He's a phenomenal athlete and we're so you know blessed to have him on our team and he's such a great guy. And the, the most unique thing about him, I think, is he's having more fun than anybody. And you can see it in his riding and that that's, I think, what separates him. Seth Westcott gets his second gold medal. So I was telling myself in the gate, I was like, hey, you're the only one that owns this medal. Let's not let any of these three other guys get this. Three top U.S. athletes could be on the podium today. We'll tell you about all their chances. It's not the start, it's the landing. We're ready. Take the ride with us. Go. Welcome to Vancouver Today. I'm Reed Cherner, and I survived the zip line outside our studio in downtown Vancouver. And I'm Christine Brennan. Seth Westcott is still the only person to hold the snowboard cross Olympic gold medal. Yesterday, he told me about his come from behind win. I was a little frustrated out of the start, but I, you know, kind of internal monologue was like, okay, just hold on to this. There's, there's some, there's going to be time in the lower half of the course, and. Uh, I had actually talked about it, uh, Jeff Archibald, who's our assistant coach for men's snowboard cross and women's snowboard cross, um, he's really kind of our playmaker and our tactician. Right before we went into that final, he jumped on the radio with me and he's like, look, Robertson is killing that start section. Um, he's like, but your lower half of the course is faster than any of these guys. And I did have my worst start of the day. and. Uh, so I had a little more to make up for than I hoped. You know, I hoped I would have been in second and just had to worry about him. Um, but you know, coming from fourth all the way to first and winning my second Olympic gold, I think just makes it that much sweeter. Christine, short program last night. Plushenko, uh, Lysacek, difference of how much? Uh, less than a point, Reed. And I'll tell you, the most surprised person probably about that in the men's short program was none other than Russia's Evgeny Plushenko, 2006 Olympic gold medalist. Uh, he has been getting these Valentine's hugs and kisses from the judges all year. Uh, huge scores, uh, big, massive victories. He comes in here expecting a coronation, and it is tight. Uh, he had a quad, Plushenko did. Second place, Evan Lysacek, again, just about a half a point behind, did not have a quad, nor did the third place, uh, Japanese Takahashi. And both, uh, so those two guys didn't have quads. That's very significant. They lose points on that by not doing it, and yet it's basically tied. What the judges are saying and what we were reporting all the past week or so and others have been uh, some of our exclusive reporting in USA Today was that the judges are looking at Plushenko's artistry and we're, we were, it turns out we're right and the judges are now saying, hey, you've got to have two parts to this equation. You can have the jumps, but it's also the artistry. Plushenko was, was not given the scores that Lysacek in particular was given and I think it portends great things for Evan Lysacek going into the long program. So that leaves us with Two other Americans? Yeah, and it was a mixed bag there. Johnny Weir actually skated quite well. Uh, he was down, uh, got an edge call, which you don't, you don't want to know, but on a triple flip, and he's in sixth place. Uh, a good, good performance by him. You know, outside the medals probably, although if everyone were to fall apart on Thursday, it's, it's still an outside chance, but I don't think so. But he skated well. Jeremy Abbott did not skate well. He's 15th. It was a disaster. He popped into thin air two of his triple jumps. Uh, clearly unable to handle the pressure. Such a beautiful skater. It was sitting there for him to be in the top three or four, and I hate to say it, but he just blew it. Lindsay Jacobellis failed a second time to win an Olympic gold medal. In Torino, you'll remember, Jacobellis fell just before crossing the finish line and had to set up for silver. This time, she clipped a gate during her semifinal heat and was disqualified. The men's half-pipe competition begins this afternoon, and the U.S. team is stacked with talent. Defending gold medalist Sean White is the favorite to win another gold. I talked to Jake Burton yesterday about White and the weather conditions the riders would face. There's been a lot of talk um, all week about conditions, both skiing and snowboarding and all that. I don't know if you, you said you just got mm -hmm. here, but whether you've seen the conditions yeah. and what you expect. And do I have it right? The half-pipe would be harder to maintain than what they than the cross yeah well the half pipe is tough because you can create a perfect pipe when it's 50 degrees out but it's how long is it going to last is the question because they really do rip it up and then you know as riders in the process of taking off and landing you know they can sort of hit that wall or that corner and and whatever carve it up or you know it not necessarily doesn't hold up as well as it might under you know colder weather conditions but 
you know, it's part of the deal, and they've decided to put snowboarding as a venue closer to the city. They did it in Italy at Torino. We were at Bardonecchi and pretty close to town, and it, you know, was kind of fun to be there. It would be great to be up at, up, up at Whistler and go out and shred all day and then, and then watch the event, but, you know, it's, it's what it is, and I think that they'll do a good job of running a good venue, and the riders will be prepared to take on whatever the conditions are. That full interview, if you're interested, is at usatoday.com. Lindsey Vaughn is expected to compete today in the women's downhill. It's her best event, and she's favored to win the gold. We talked to her before the Olympics about her need for speed. Going fast is awesome. <laughs> it's so much fun. To have the wind in your face and to have nothing stopping you from going fast but yourself, it's a really amazing feeling. Your main goal is to be as fast as you can and continue to build momentum from start to finish. And the fewer mistakes that you make, the faster you'll be. And when there's a flat section, you know, it's really important to carry your speed because if you make a mistake, let's say right before the flat section, um, you're going to carry a lot less speed going across the flats and therefore just continuously dumping time. When there's terrain, you know, when there's rolls and things like that, those are places where you can make time. You know, if you press down on the backside of a roll, you can, you can gain speed and gain momentum. It's all a matter of, I think, how you inspect the course and how well you know where you're going and being able to um, ski the best that you can despite, you know, all those, those little details that could give you trouble. Shawnee Davis competes in the 1,000 meter ski speed skating event. USA Today reporter Mike Dodd breaks down the competition. He's undefeated in this event this year. He's won four consecutive uh, international events. He's a world record holder. He also is a defending Olympic champion, trying to become the first person to ever win uh, this event twice in the Olympics. The South Koreans are much stronger than anticipated. Taebom Mo could end up being a strong competitor in this race. Shani is uh, biting at, at the bit. He, he had two races so far, but they were primarily just preparation races for uh, for this one. Even with the slow ice, which might be a little bit of an equalizer, Shani is uh, clearly the prohibitive favorite going into the 1,000. Road trip, Christine. I know you're going uh, <laughs> yeah. up to Whistler. So you're going for Vaughn. Yeah. Uh, but we do have Davis and uh, we do have uh, the snowboarders. Yeah, oh, there's, but, yeah there's some interesting storylines definitely uh, for Wednesday here, the first week of the Olympics. Uh, but the Lindsey Vaughn story, we've been following it. Everyone's, everyone knows. I think there are grandmothers in Biloxi who uh, have never heard of sports who, are, who know about Lindsey Vaughn and, and her bruised shin. Um, this is going to be fascinating. I am going up there and seeing it. Uh, I have no idea what to expect. Uh, she could win the Olympic gold medal, predicted to, of course, to do that over the last, uh, you know, gosh, several months of the greatest skier the last two years uh, around the world. Uh, or she could have trouble. And I think that's the fascinating thing about this. This storyline is really interesting, more so than almost any other at the Olympic Games. So I'm, I'm anxious to see. I, I certainly hope Lindsey Vaughn can do it. But I also could see a scenario where she doesn't medal, and yet the effort is the story, and I think uh, you know sometimes an athlete just giving it a go is, is a good thing as well, as we know. Yes. Visitors to the Outdoor Olympic Flame are coming away disappointed because a chain link fence is blocking the view. It's like, this is like the main event. This is the baby right here. <laughs> and we can't even get close to it. We've come, we left at 5 o'clock this morning to come and see this like amazing flame. And yet, what is this? A stinking chain link fence. Like, I don't get that. What is the deal with that? I don't like the fence. I don't like fences. I'm all about open places and no boundaries. So I'm glad they're going to take it down. It's too pretty to keep it caged. We came up here for the day to just take in all the festivities and to find the flame behind the fence is very disheartening. Um, I think it's actually a good thing because I think if uh, the fence wasn't there, there'd be a lot of people climbing it or touching it and there could be danger. Someone could get hurt. Um, they, they've let it, you know, it's quite open around it so you can get pictures. I mean, you have to go through the little holes, but yeah, at least you can get a picture and, you know, I'm sure they'll have postcards and things like that. So um, I think it's a safety measure and I would hate to see it destroyed. It's really obstructing this beautiful view and, and um, my friend here who lives in Vancouver was just telling me that they're thinking of moving it and so that people can get a better view of it, which makes sense because it's such a beautiful structure. We'll be back tomorrow with the results from all the competition. But before we go, here's the second installment of our Learn to Curl series. 
Stay tuned, it's more complicated than you think. We'll see you tomorrow. Tap back for two. And it's a draw for two for blue. And that's what you'll hear the announcers say, and that means that blue scored two points. Today's curling tip will be on the objective of our game and how to score. Hi, I'm Georgina Wheatcroft, two-time world curling champion and Olympic bronze medalist in 2002 in Salt Lake City. Curling is all about scoring more than your opposition, just like most other sports. To score, it's all about getting closest to the button. So to score in curling, your rock actually has to come into the house, which is 12 feet in diameter. But when it comes down to it, it's all about being closest to the button. So when you're watching curling at the Olympics, scoring may look confusing. So let me break it down for you. In this situation, it's two points for blue because they are closest to the button. And red does not score any points because only one team can score per end. Let's look at another situation. So although this situation looks really good for blue and they have five stones in the house, it's one red because it's all about closest to the button. So how much do you think you've learned? Let's look at one more situation and see if you can guess who scores. So what do you think? Wow. Pretty interesting, there's lots of rocks in play. If you said red one point, you're right, because it's all about closest to the button. So when you're watching the Olympics, you may hear some interesting lingo, like hog, hammer, hurry hard. Well, let me tell you what they mean. So this is the hog line. A thrower must let go of their stone prior to this hog line and also at the other end of the sheet for a rock to be in play, it must cross this line. Having the hammer means that you're the team that has the last rock of that end. And what you wanna do with the hammer is score points. And this last term, curlers are well known for. Have you heard, hurry hard! And this is encouraging our teammates to sweep as hard as they can to help get the rock down the sheet of ice. What I can help you with is, what those foreign teams are saying. Maybe they have some secret language.